As a writer, I go to author's fairs in various places. Sometimes I sell a lot of books, but usually not. The best part of them is networking with other writers, and that's what happened in late April of this year. I met someone you are going to meet today via this podcast. Join us for a conversation with Amanda Hope Haley, the red-haired archaeologist. At that author's fair in Chattanooga, I was seated next to a friendly redhead with beautiful, naturally curly hair that I'm always jealous of because I have stick straight wand hair. <laughs> I heard Alice Walker refer to it as corn silk one time. Amanda Hope Haley and I got to talking for several reasons. She writes about the Bible and so do I, and she lives in the neighborhood I used to live in in Chattanooga, so we talked property values. But she differs in one big way. She is an archaeologist, specifically a biblical archaeologist. And most people don't meet very many archaeologists. I had not met one since my college days in the 1970s, so it's been a while. I wanted to talk to her some more and where better than on a podcast. So welcome to the podcast, Amanda. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm just uh, elated that you're able to talk to us. Uh, you're a busy traveling person. And Amanda is perfectly capable of telling her own story. And that's why I'm going to let her do that pretty much. So let's just start at the beginning. Where were you born and raised? I was born and raised in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, um, which is the geographical center of the state. And people who, who don't know Tennessee well, it's basically greater Nashville. Uh, so, yeah, born and raised there. And my, my parents met at MTSU. Um, most of my family is from within an hour of that area. And even my husband's family, who I met later, he's from within an hour of that area, too. So I went to public school there. My mom was a high school French teacher and my dad worked for a company called Ingram that they are there at the time they were the world's largest book distributor. Mm -hmm. So my dad was kind of in the book business. My mom taught French and English, actually she taught a lot of English literature as well. So I think books were kind of in my blood from the very, very beginning, which is nice. Um, but um, my, my parents were great. They always, they always said to me when I was in school, you can go to whatever college you can get a scholarship to was the way they put it. And um, coming out of high school, I got a scholarship to Rhodes College, which is a Presbyterian school. It's in Memphis, Tennessee. And we actually lived in Memphis for several years when I was a child. So I think I had sort of rosy memories of that city. And I, I love the idea of going back to Rhodes. I loved that Rhodes was in a city. I'm kind of a city person. Uh, if I never had to drive a car again, that would make me so, so very happy. Um, I like walking and biking and all of those kinds of things. And so I really thought thrived there. And one thing about Rhodes College being Presbyterian is you are required to take four courses in religious studies, which was fine with me. I, I grew up Southern Baptist. Um, I grew up with the church telling me how important it was to read my Bible every day to have quiet time. And I will say that, um, you know, God really got a hold of me when I was in high school. And at that point, I, I was reading the Bible every night. And I actually started to notice some things. I noticed some things that seemed to be contradictory between what, what the Bible said and maybe some of what I was hearing in the church. And I'm so thankful that I'm wired to be one of those people who, instead of just abandoning the Bible, I think I leaned into those areas. And so when I got to Rhodes and I was first faced with the academic study of the Bible, um, I had lots of questions, but I, I leaned into those and I worked through them. And the, the second course that I took was one in biblical archaeology. And I just fell in love with it. And I had, um, I had great advisors there who were themselves Harvard graduates, and they encouraged me to to pursue this. They're the ones who suggested to me that maybe I could go get a master's degree from Harvard. And also one professor worked with me in 2001 to get me my first scholarship to go dig in Israel. Um, I was supposed to go to Tel Rehov, which um, if, if you do a lot of biblical studies, there's this there's this group 
of people who like to say that King David and King Solomon did not exist because there's there's not a lot of physical evidence of them. And the evidence that we do have, some people will question, well, Tel Rehob is actually one of the dig sites that really added, added fuel to that fire. Well, I ended up not getting to go because that's also when um, Israel was in the middle of the second intifada. That's when a lot of bus bombings were happening and, and that sort of thing. And so the trip was canceled, but my professors continued encouraging me. And I ended up going to Harvard where I finally went on my first dig in 2004. And that was with uh, Lawrence Steger. He he was my advisor. Um, he had him and another man named Peter Machinist. So uh, Professor Machinist taught me all about Hebrew Bible. Um, my degree is technically in Hebrew scripture and interpretation, but practically functionally it, it's in biblical archaeology. So I had both of them, but Steger is, was, he passed away a few years ago. He is um, an expert in Philistines. And so my first dig site that I ever went to is uh, Tel Ashkelon. It's 10 kilometers north of Gaza. It is one of the five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis in the Old Testament. And it's It's a great site for, of course, learning about the Philistines, but also understanding how Israel interacted with all of their neighbors over the years. And of course, you get down below the late Bronze Age, you're getting into Canaanite territory, too. And so Ashkelon is a beautiful site. It overhangs the Mediterranean Ocean and. I just I just fell in love with it. Um, it's I love it. As it turned out, I love sitting in dirty holes and literally brushing dirt off of dirt. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how I got started. Oh, wow. OK, so was there anything in your childhood that made you think you'd be an archaeologist or was it a uh, college thing? It was a total college thing. I went to Rhodes planning to go into some sort of international law. Maybe I, I think I, I wanted to be a diplomat, something like that, maybe an ambassador someday, some, mm-hmm. something along those lines. And I had when I was in high school in Tennessee, we had something called the governor's schools. Um, I think Georgia has governor's academies. They're basically the same thing. And uh, I went to the governor's school for international studies when I was in high school and I did a lot of study of uh, the Middle East at that point, had just the tiniest amount of Arabic you can imagine, just enough to understand the alphabet, basically. And um, I, so I learned some about it then. And when I got to Rhodes, I uh, started studying uh, the Middle East there, too. And so I technically have a, like a, a dual undergraduate um, in international studies and then also in religious studies. So, um, yeah, my, my plan was to do something with maybe the Middle East uh, in the modern world. But I think something just kind of spun. And so now I, I study and I write about the ancient Middle East. It, it also kind of fits in my head. <laughs> yeah. OK, so um You've talked about your college years and how it all started. Not only do we not meet very many archaeologists, most of us don't meet very many Harvard grads. I know a few. Maybe you're the fifth one for me. (laughs) Um, Other than the fact that your um, mentors in, in undergrad encouraged you to go there, was was there any other reason? And and what was it like being there? For some of it's it's such a mystery. Um, I, I will say I loved my time at Harvard. I look back on it very, very fondly. I was in the divinity school and I have all sorts of stories about that. But, um, one is when we sat down for orientation, the first day, the Dean came out and he told us what is really the glorious history of Harvard divinity school. And that is Harvard would not exist without the divinity school. The school was of course founded as, as a religious institution to begin with. And he made the point to us that for the rest of the university, the divinity school is almost a bit of an embarrassment. I think it's viewed maybe as anti-science. And he actually called us the um, bastard children of Harvard. Um, But he encouraged us that, um, you know, if it weren't for you guys, this institution wouldn't even exist. And so I think the experience of the divinity school is set apart from maybe what a lot of the other graduate schools uh, a lot of what they see. Plus, I was in I was in the biblical studies department. And so the majority of my advisors of my professors were conservative Jews. And so they believed in the Bible themselves. They they 
believes that historically accurate God breeds, all that, not all, but a lot of them did. And so that was actually really healing for me. When, when I was at Rhodes, I learned about the Bible academically. Um, I learned about it as, as literature and all that. And, and, those are still techniques that I employ even in my writing. I think it's very important to understand how the Bible developed over time, where it is in history, that sort of thing. Um, but it created, a, I never really had a crisis of faith, but almost it almost made me a little bit schizophrenic. I would find myself understanding the Bible, the mechanics of it on one side, and then having a relationship with God that was separate. And it was actually at Harvard with some of these professors that all of that was able to come back together. And so it was a sweet time for me. I actually had spiritual growth while I was there. Plus, um, there's something about going to Israel for the first time, experiencing all of that, that the people that I went with um, are people I still love to this day. When archaeologists regularly dig, um, we, we call it our dig family because you're spending, you know, two months or so on, you know, in another country, often not seeing your own relatives or anything. And you're with these people and you're with them year after year. And so they, um, Ashkelon became like a family. And when we got back to Rose, you know, we still had classes together and we were hanging out and it, they, they were, they were like my second family, which, which made it nice too. So I think all of that is why I look back on it. Um, well, plus, I mean, I, I, I learned a lot. Harvard is hard. Yes. <laughs> um, definitely made my first C's when I got there and struggled through some things. Um, but it, I, I, I learned a lot and my, my view of the world um, grew in so many different ways. I was encouraged and not, not all professors were wonderful. I, I have one guy who I must admit, he's probably the person I learned the most from um, he, he would teach about um, second se second temple Judaism. And I won't use his name, but the very first course I had with him, we went downstairs. It was in the basement of a building. The ceiling was really low. There were no windows. So it's already feeling a little bit oppressive. And he comes banging in the door. And we're all sitting there and he just announces, I hate Christians and I hate Southerners. And I mean, I felt myself just like slide down in my chair because of my bright red hair <laughs> and in an accent that I'm, you know, pretty good with with getting rid of. In fact, most people at Harvard thought I was from the Midwest. But still, if he ever caught me talking on the phone to my mother, he would have known <laughs> that I'm very much a Southern girl. So there there were those people there. Um, but I learned to just sort of keep my head down. And I learned a lot from him. And so I think that was important too, knowing that just because you don't 100 percent agree with someone on absolutely everything doesn't mean that you can't learn from them. And sometimes those people can actually be your best teachers because those situations really taught me how to be discerning. And you, I don't think you can learn discernment if, if everything's easy all the time. You need a few bumps in the road and you need some pushback and, you know, all of that to, to really, I think, grow and become an independent thinker. And that's really what all education should be about. We all major in in whatever it is that we major in archaeology for me, Hebrew. But at the end, I think the goal of most institutions is for people to be able to come out of it as individual thinkers. And um, anyway, so when, when people rag on Harvard, I tend to take up for it because of the wonderful experience I had there. I'm also quick to say that was my experience. A lot of those professors are gone now. They've retired. Some have died. Um, but for that moment in time and that place where I was, it was it was a place of fertile growth. Yeah. I do have to say, though, that, you know, you were strong and you were able to, to do that. But in today's academia, if I were to go into a class and say, say, I just want you to know right up front, I hate yeah, blank whoever. and I hate people from blank, uh, they would be, you know, they would be rethinking my contract. I just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, I mean, I'm in a public institution, a public college, but even still, you know, uh, but Harvard has such a cachet, has such a reputation in history that they can kind of get away with it. You know, it's almost like they're a, they're a mean person, as I would say, <laughs> they're unlikely yeah. to lose any kind of a job because they're already at Harvard. So they can be as prejudiced as they want to and get away with it. You know, 
Yeah, I mean, if, if they're there, they're writing prolifically, they're, you know, making a name for Harvard in that way. I think things get overlooked. Plus, so many of these chairs are so heavily funded. And I think once you not only have tenure, but you have a chair with somebody's name attached to it and all of that, it really is a position for life if if they, they choose for it to be. Um, and I, I do think maybe there are some bigger egos there, too. I definitely encountered more <laughs> egos at Harvard. <laughs> and, and I will say, and, and and that for me was not my advisors. Um, and he was also great. He, he understood what was going on. He has a very gentle spirit. He's one of those people that only has to sleep four hours a night, which I can't imagine. So as a result, I mean, like he I, I don't even know how many tens of thousands of books that he's read. Um, he he was somebody that I could go and talk to when I got frustrated with maybe some of those bigger egos, he would be able to, you know, encourage in the right way and, you know, help, help me, help me grow and learn how to, how to deal with those people or how not to deal with them, how to just, you know, let it roll off my shoulder and, and move on. (laughs) That's life encountering different personalities. Yes. So, after those years and getting your master's, what was your next step? How does one start to practice archaeology? <laughs> <laughs> For me, university. Absolutely. Um, so I went with Harvard and actually once I finished my master's degree, we, my husband and I fled back to Tennessee because we quite simply could not afford another month's rent. My husband and I married in between undergrad and graduate school and he um, made, he gave me the giant gift of postponing his own master's so that I could go to Harvard. And um, that's, uh, we, we actually have our 20th wedding anniversary next month. And I don't know, I've just been feeling the weight of the sacrifices he has made for my little career our entire married life. I'm thankful for him. Well, so we came back to Tennessee for him to do his master's for us to uh, make some money, pay off Harvard. And then I needed to take a year in order to get your PhD in what I studied. You have to have Hebrew, Greek, Latin, French, and German. I had never taken German and I needed to I was good with the Hebrew, but I needed to brush up on everything else. I hadn't had Latin since high school. So the plan was to take a year. Um, I deferred my PhD and all that, but I, um, the deferment turned into derailment to a degree. When I got back to Middle Tennessee, um, I ended up getting a job with Thomas Nelson, who at the time was the largest book pub- Bible publisher in the world. They've since been acquired by HarperCollins. So they're part of HarperCollins, now owns them and Zondervan. But uh, I got a job with them translate, doing new Bible translation. And um, I got into that. I was you know, only going to do it for a little bit of time. But then also I suffered my first miscarriage. And that started us down a medical journey. And I ended up not going, not going back for my PhD, which is something I still think about a lot. Um, but this is how I got into publishing. So while I was working with the Bible translation, doing translation work, and then I ended up staying with the translation for seven whole years, I wrote a lot of commentary. I did a ton of editing. I, I was very involved with that project. It was during that time that we were dealing with our infertility issues and I was having surgeries and things like that. And um, Thomas Nelson actually came to me and asked me to write a book about infertility. Um, it wasn't something that I looked for. And I know other authors will get frustrated. <laughs> what is everybody wants to know? How'd you get your first book deal? And I really slid in the back door, kind of the same way with Harvard. I feel like I slid in the back door there because I had some great recommendations. But um, okay. But let me say about that. I mean, for them to ask you to write about something that was so painful, it was that a little bit it it strikes me as a little inappropriate it 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 wasn't we all knew each other very well at that okay. point the man that i worked for um he was the head of nelson bibles at the time he also went to church with my family and he is someone that i've almost considered a second father we got to know each other very very well um through work but then then through through church also and what was happening at the time was Nelson Bibles was launching a new imprint that was called Inscribed. Um, it actually does still exist. It's kind of been in and out of production over the years, but they were putting together a group of seven women authors to write about the Bible, but then also to write about kind of hot topics of the time. And so out of that first seven books, at least six of them were technically Bible studies. And then mine was the first topical one. As it turned out with the buyout from Harper Collins and all of that, mine is the only topical one. 
one that was ever written as a part of the inscribed collection. But um, it was just it, it was circumstances. It was the way it all came together, because also while I was working on the Bible translation, other parts of Thomas Nelson, other editors were coming to me asking me to do theological reviews. That's how I got into doing ghost writing um, for popular Christian authors, um, I, just editing stuff, all of that. And so I they knew they knew I could write. They knew my background. And I suffered through so much of that painful story while I was working with them um, that it, it made sense. In fact, the, the way it happened was uh, Frank had called me and he'd called me about something else, a ghostwriting project, maybe something like that. And I had um, I had two friends from church I, during this time period. I found that people who were going through infertility reached out to me. Um, and I had two friends within 24 hours who both reached out to me and both had miscarriages. And they were women that I was very close to, who I still count among my closest friends. And Frank called me about whatever it was. And then he knew these women too. And I ended up you know, without naming names, just telling him that this happened and how much it, um, it just it was impacting me that day. And he paused and I didn't know about inscribed at that point, but they'd apparently been kicking it around. So he's like, if you were to write a book about infertility, what what would it be? And so, um, I mean, I sat down and in about 45 minutes, I had the entire thing outlined. I actually still got pictures of that somewhere. Um, and I called him back and what I outlined is exactly what the book ended up being. And so it was um, it, it was the right time. It was it was the right group of people. It, it was what I was supposed to do in that moment. And um I, I'll spoil the ending. We don't have children. I think one thing that did set my book apart and maybe even my story apart is I am not one of those women who, you know, at the end of the story, I end up with with a child that wasn't God's path for us. Um, I think he has other plans. I have nieces and nephews and godchildren, and I still get very sad sometimes um, when I'm around kids. But I also know that this is the path God had for me, because if I weren't if I were a mom, I would be so focused on that as I should be. And I wouldn't be able to travel places speaking and go to Israel and dig and, you know, do do all the things that that I'm able to do. And so I'm, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And it all works together. And I, I kind of love that that part of my story is out there when people are finding me because of archaeology. I think it humanizes me and it also gives me a better understanding of grief, at least from that perspective. Um, I think it gives me a lot more compassion for other people. And um, I, I can look back on that time now with a, with a lot of thankfulness. Um, so it's just part of the story. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that and sharing that. I think what you've just said will help a lot of listeners who listen to this. Um, you know, it's, it's not something probably that you as you were going through it, wanted to write a book about, but it ended up, yeah, being, um, you know. So, so you were working for Thomas Nelson, mm -hmm. and were you going on digs in between those times? I was not. No, um, I uh, just spoke with my undergraduate advisor a week or two ago, and we were getting caught up on things, and I remembered that somewhere. In the middle of all of that, when we were, the other thing is too, when, you know, when you flip from 29 to 30, all of a sudden the doctors go into panic mode and it's, if you don't get pregnant now, this is going to be it. And we went through a lot of stuff um, and it, it was a very, very hard time. And in looking, you know, I mean, I sat at my life and I remember getting I remember getting um, a copy of Biblical Archaeology Review, which is a popular magazine about archaeology. It has it has some great stuff in there. They publish some things by scholars, but it's a glossy magazine. Lots of beautiful pictures. Very easy, I think, for um, for the public to understand. And anyway, I received that and I remember just crying as I was holding it and just now nah, I'm getting choked up now, but just feeling like this is it. I'm, I'm never going to be able to go back and do this again. This time of my life is over. You know, I guess I'm going to be in publishing forever. And at that point thinking I was going to be writing other people's New York times bestsellers for the rest of my life. And, um, yeah, just thinking that that's it, that that was the new path for me. And I, I genuinely mourned it. And then because I wrote that book about infertility, um, I, another publisher, Harvest House Publishers, um, acquisitions there 
an acquisitions editor sought me out. I'm not sure how exactly she came to to have Marin Among the Fruitful, um, but she sought me out and, you know, asked me, you know, it, what was your follow up to this book? You know, what, what, what would it be? And I actually, with Inscribed, the timing was really bad. I had notoriously terrible timing with, with publishing. My, my book came out two weeks before the HarperCollins acquisition went through. And as soon as it went through, they shuttered the Inscribed collection completely. And so I had been contracted to do a second book, which never came to fruition. And so I had fallen into... Uh, kind of the rut of, of doing a lot of editing and theological reviewing and, and ghostwriting and doing all of those things. And, um, yeah, it, it, it was not, it was not a creative time for me. It was just sort of the grind of, of being in the writing world. But anyway, she came to me and was like, you know, Hey, if you were going to write this book and I took the call with her because I felt like I should, but honestly, the fire was out of me. I didn't really feel like writing anything else, but my next book was supposed to be about hermeneutics. Um, so about you know, how we interpret the Bible, how we understand the Bible, that sort of thing. And she, um, by the time we got off the phone, and after about 45 minutes, like I was sold, I, I had to get back into it. I had to start writing my own stuff. And so it was with her and with Harvest House that my brand was relaunched. And they're the ones who sent me back over to Israel and got me back into all of it again. And so at the age of 37, I made my not so glorious return <laughs> to the field <laughs> and realized that, you know, most of the students who were in a square with me were almost young enough to be my children. And it was it was awkward. And and, and wonderful <laughs> at the same time being there and digging again. And, um, but it, it came back quickly and I was with my dig family because Ash Kalan, Ash Kalan closed. Uh, they had a couple of closing seasons, um, but they officially shuttered uh, tell Ash Kalan in 2016. And then everyone who was a part of that, well, almost everyone who's a part of that group went and then they broke ground on a new site called Tel Shimron, which is in Galilee. And it's, um, it's mentioned to the Bible a couple of times as basically a waypoint, nothing Nothing really happened until Sharon in the Bible, but it uh, was continuously occupied from the Neolithic all the way up until today. Um, there's a there's a modern cemetery on the top of it. And we had to protect our dig sites because people it, it's it's a park. And so people do dirt bike riding and um, goat herds would be would move their goats through every single day. And so it's it's literally been continuously occupied since the Neolithic. And um so it, it's a great site that we're learning a ton about. It's teaching us a lot about um, trade in the region and the way these different cities worked with each other and worked with Jerusalem throughout time. Um, so it's it's great. And it's it's all the people I got started with, um, which is awesome. So and I love them. <laughs> yeah. Well, OK, so since we're on that, you know, what is it like on an archaeology? archaeological dig i mean you, you say you're like family because you're there for two months or so and and all that but you know we see movies um yeah. that they'll you know harrison ford or somebody doing something and um yeah and got one coming I, out in two weeks i'm guessing yeah <laughs> yes okay. and i i know you get asked that all the time is it like in the movies so you know it's a little silly but what is it like on a daily basis what are y'all doing Oh, it is. That's not silly at all, because I think people like I think movies like Indiana Jones got that, that's what uh, piques people's interest. You know, so I'm glad that exists. But I always start off by saying Indiana Jones is not an archaeologist. Um, pretty much nothing that he does on film has anything to do with archaeology. Um, it's more a reflection of where archaeology started. And so in the late 19th century, early 20th century, what you had were wealthy Europeans going into Egypt and Israel and other places, but especially Egypt and Israel, um, treasure hunting, looking for whatever really cool things that they could find and taking them out and then taking them home to go into private collections or museums or something like that. Um, and so that's where the great movies come from because they, they take advantage of the sort of the swashbuckling nature of that. Yeah. 
actual archaeology um, today, I, I think first off, the field is working really hard to make up for that history. Um, to, to say that treasure hunting is sort of archaeology's original sin is is really not too far off. Today it is very it is it is as scientific as we can make it, and it's increasingly scientific. In fact, in in the 15 years from my first dig until the one I went to most recently, the technology has changed so very much. And so you start off with a tell. They'll take, um, if it's a brand new tell that you haven't dug at before, they'll use ground penetrating radar to try to figure out what is below, you know, what, what can we see? Where do we think is a good place to start? And then they'll kind of take a chunk out of the side of the tell using some large equipment, using an excavator or something like that. And then you go in and you create grids. So squares and the grids are today they are lined up based on gps um and they're yeah so it, everything is is perfectly laid out um a lot of the math has been taken out of it which i appreciate that was never my strong suit <laughs> but um you sit down and then you just you start digging down literally centimeter by centimeter sometimes yeah and so and by sitting down actually you don't sit down one of one of the rules of archaeology good archaeology is you never want to lean on your knees or sit on your bottom because especially as you get into lower areas where um, artifacts have been suppressed by dirt by tons of dirt for thousands of years everything is very very fragile and so you want to do everything standing on the four corners of your feet as much as possible um so it's it, it can be backbreaking work okay. from bending over or you do a lot of squatting. Squatting is probably preferable and doing close up work right there in front of you. Um, that can be challenging. Um, but then also when you start moving large sections, like sometimes it, a grid supervisor will come through and say, you know, OK, we want to take this down get 10 centimeters. And so that's when you bring out the pickaxes and um, the the, uh, the terreas they're they're like a hose um it's different equipment you start physically moving soil out you put we put them in these things called goofas which are basically baskets that are made out of uh, recycles tires and when a goofa is full of dirt and rock it weighs about 50 pounds and so you know you have to lift that dump it into a wheelbarrow then when the wheelbarrow is full you have to you know take it out to a big hill run it up the hill and dump it so it's, it's very labor intensive um of course it's hot i'm telling you all the terrible parts first <laughs> it's odd thing is because we we do think you know it's that the the native people in the movies do all the work and the the white europeans just, just stand around and point and and steal stuff you know yeah <laughs> the way it looks yeah, but it's, it, you know, most in, anybody can come. Archaeological sites are always looking for volunteers. Um, I frequently will post links to that kind of thing. And honestly, people of all ages from all nations uh, have been there. The, the last time I was there, there was a couple in from Germany and he had just retired. They were uh, in their early 60s, I believe, and had always wanted to do it. So they came and just did, I think, maybe three weeks there to, to have the experience. I think one of them loved it and one of them didn't. And you can always tell who likes it based on how dirty they are at least this is my theory because i have picked, like at the end of a day from from sweeping movie or everything i mean i have dirt crusted in everywhere i'm absolutely disgusting and i remember when i was at harvard one of my friends went with us and at the end of the day he still had like creases in his button-down shirt <laughs> The guy never had dirt on him. And he also did not go into archaeology, never went back to it. I think was miserable absolutely the whole time. So that's my theory is uh, the more you get into it, the dirtier you are. But it's I mean, it's fine. It's it's you start to build relationships with the people you're working near nowadays um they'll actually play music when, when we first went you know we we didn't have cell phones over there we certainly weren't playing music or anything like that it was very quiet and you'd hear conversation you hear the different languages of different people um but now it's you know it's nice they, they were actually it was funny too they the kids were really into classic music which uh for them was music from the 1990s <laughs> and i graduated from high school in 1999 so the whole time i was like i i mean i loved the music it was the music of my childhood <laughs> but they ended up calling it classic <laughs> so i don't know i, I was in this funny place of uh, feeling included and then feeling like a little bit of an outsider too but um yeah i, I think you bring to it 
you know, whatever it is that you bring to it. If you have a good attitude, you know, it's going to be hard work. There are days that are so exciting when you find something magical, um, something that's perfectly intact and you get to, you get to take that out of the soil. That feeling can't be beat. But for every one of those days, there are 10 days where you find nothing but broken pieces of pottery that for every single one, you know, you pull it out, you put it in a bucket that you're going to have to wash it and then you're going to have to mark it. And then you're going to have to catalog it and do all of these kinds of things. And so, um, it's, it's tedious, but, um, there are great rewards to it too. So you have to be a person of patience. Yeah, I think that's really important. So yeah. hard worker, patient and, you know, try to uh, try to be in, you know, decent cardiovascular shape <laughs> when you go. Just and just to back up a little bit, you use the word tell. And could you um, de- define that or explain what a tell is? Yes. So a tell is just um, it's actually called that in Hebrew or Arabic. And in both languages, it means mound. Um, so the way civilizations developed over time is you know, just let's just start with the, the Neolithic and people at that point, um, they they were if they were building cities, they were building them round. They were much more sporadic. There weren't, weren't nearly as many buildings and structures. But so what they would do is look out at the earth around them and say, well, I want to be next to a water source. Um, you know, this this place is high. We get some prevailing winds up here. Uh, this place is high. We can see if invaders are coming to attack us. You know, they would have a certain set of criteria area of, I think this is a good place to make my home. Well, so, you know, the first civilization would come through, they would build, something would happen, they would leave, they would die, there would be an earthquake, something would cause them to abandon the site. After a hundred years, a few hundred years, the earth takes everything back over, covers it over. And then here comes this next group of people with the same set of criteria and they end up building. And so over time, the same area gets picked naturally. Um, But then also, especially as you get uh, further up in time, that that same area also gets higher and higher and higher <laughs> because of the previous civilizations that have been there. And so that's how the tell develops. And so what's on the very top of it is going to be modern. Um, often in Israel, the very top layers are going to be Islamic era. And then you just go back in time from that as you get lower and lower. So, you know, Roman and, and uh, Persian and you know, everything below there in history. So for you, what's the most exciting thing you've found? I know that's a tacky question, but that is not a tacky question. I love that question. Um, my favorite thing is something called a bowl lamp bowl deposit. And let me say, I, you find skeletons, you find burials, jewelry is always a lot of fun to find. I always like finding spindle whirls too, because mm-hmm. that's just something that's um, sort of alien to me, but also like I enjoy sewing and everything. So yeah. there's something about a spindle whirl that speaks to me, but the best thing I ever found um, was at Ashkelon. It was in a late Bronze Age layer. And so it was um, it was actually Canaanite and it was something called a bowl and bowl deposit. And so they created a perfectly formed bowl, a perfectly formed lamp that they put inside that bowl, then took another bowl and turned it on top of the lamp. And so you had sort of a sphere and then they would bury these underneath the, the foundation stones of their homes. And so it was this idea of bringing, you know, light and warmth into the home and to find those perfectly intact. It was poignant because of what it was. It was also the first like big thing I ever got to excavate by myself. And I got trusted with that um, by, by the older staff members who were there so much so that um, when I was in Israel in 2019, my husband and my parents came and joined me after the dig and I I took them on a two week tour of the country and we ended up going into an antiquities dealer, a legal antiquities dealer. And um, the three of them pitched in together and bought me um, an an iron age lamp. So a little bit newer, but it looks a lot like the one that I found. So Mm -hmm. I love having that. And it gives me an opportunity to have a visual aid when I'm teaching adults and children. I think it's really cool to be able to show people what lamps looks like. Cause I think when we read about them, when we read, we read a lot of things in the Bible, we picture items in the way that we know them today and lamps of the iron age and the bronze age look really, really different from our electrical versions or even our oil lamps of my grandmother's age. Well, we could probably talk for another couple hours on your, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 
and I, I would uh, encourage the listeners to um, go back to their their history books and remind themselves of what Bronze Age and Iron Age. I'm sitting here thinking, OK, I know this. <laughs> I, know those, I know those years. I'm, For example, David was in the Iron Age, right? Yes. 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 So, yeah, we know he was about a thousand BC. So exactly. that's what we're talking. OK. Bronze yeah. Age would have been like pre-Moses. Um, no, Moses would have been probably like middle bronze. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, so, um, like, that's a whole, my, in fact, uh, my next book is, um, going to be about the intersections of Egypt and Israel. And th- there's a quagmire there. There is no definitive answer for when yes. Moses was, but, um, popularly people will say around 1800, maybe something like that. So he's squarely middle age, middle bronze. And also the timelines, when you say iron age, iron age for Israel is different from iron age for say England um, and it's much later and so those those labels are culture specific oh uh, or, or I should say regionally specific not culture but regionally specific okay so you all go do some research those are <laughs> um, so along with your work in archaeology you're an author of biblical studies and I believe children's books I know you mentioned that <laughs> and so how did, how did the, that become part of your life and you mentioned, I wanted to stop here a minute, though. You said you were a ghostwriter. Mm-hmm. And um, I assume that was because you were working for the publisher. And yes. so they would say, so-and-so famous person. And I'm not going to ask you who. I know that's a no-no. Okay, but so-and-so. You can ask me, but I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't shown me, right? That's what <laughs> um, so so famous person that everybody knows in Christian whatever circles is needs to put out a book but they don't have time to write because they're too busy so exactly so you sit down with them and 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 then you write it you you interview them etc it depends it depends on the person it depends on the project um one person called the publisher at one point i was actually in the room when this phone call came through and this individual asked the questions what is my next book who is writing it and how much am i getting paid so there's that side of it and then um Gosh. there's another person yeah i know it, that that's the worst um so there's that side of it but then there's also um another person that this person was um, at a beach location, going to be there for a few weeks. And they flew me out there to meet with that person to spend time. And we would get together in the morning and have a conversation. And then I would go right. And then we get together in the afternoon and go over it all. And that was very collaborative. It made me made it a lot easier for me to capture that person's voice. Um, and that was that was a good experience. That is a person who I formed a relationship with, um, you know, that was really good. And then now what you're seeing, I, I think, especially in the Christian industry, there is something about ghostwriting that just feels a little bit unsavory. It just feels a little. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get it. <laughs> um, but what you're seeing now is more authors are starting to credit people and they're not even calling it ghostwriting anymore. They're oh, what are they calling it now? Um uh, not contributor or something like that, uh, but like, pardon, collaborator, collaborator. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that's what they're starting to call it now, which is nice. Yeah. So um, the last project like that that I was involved in, I, I would not say that I get it, it was a true collaboration. Um, and my name is on the book. Uh, Jeremy Jeremy Camp is a musician, and his wife Adi is one of my favorite people on the planet. And we got hooked up through my last pu- my my last publisher knew that I had done writing collaborative writing, let's say in the past, and they put us together and I, you know, we became friends. I got to know them. And honestly, I guided them more than anything else. It really was their words that went into it, but they also were so happy to credit me with it. Um, And so that to me is a very honest project and good relationships came out of it, Um, you know, to the point where we, you know, still text and check in with each other and, and all of that kind of thing. And so I, yeah, I'm glad to see the industry hopefully moving that way. I hope there's there's more of that in the future. It's just a little more fair. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, I think it's the word is ethical. Uh, yeah, yes, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I'm not picking on you. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's some, I mean, we're both writers and yeah. so we know how incredibly hard it is and it's, you know, we want people to get their due. And so often people think, oh, you write. So, you know, you shouldn't, why should I pay you for it? Or it's not worth you know, it's just what you do. And it's like, this is hard work, people. It so, is. It is. Yeah. And it, I always felt like there was a certain amount of kind of paying my dues, mm-hmm. you know, getting out there. And, and it, that was a different kind of experience that I did make some connections with and all of that. And I don't plan to do it again in the future, but it's something that is part of my story. It helps me understand the publishing world that much better. Um, I mean, even my my dad was in charge of international transportation for books, which has nothing to do with writing, but still understanding how that side of the industry works, mm-hmm. I feel like has been helpful to me just to to be a, you know, a more fully formed author and to be able to function better in the industry. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting you say that because um I work with a lot of people who want to be published and who want to be writers and everything. And, and they're, um, they just don't understand why nobody wants to publish a book. (laughs) And, you know, they, it's so much more complicated than they realize. They think, well, there's so many people getting published and my book's just as good as theirs. And what is the deal? And there's a lot of, I don't, I don't like the word luck, but there's a lot of being in the right place at the right time stuff. And there's, you know, who, you know, and, and, and things like that, but there is, but you do have to pay your dues. You know, I heard a, someone say that you, uh, in fiction, you can't really expect to be published until you've written a million words of fiction. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. I think they just meant that it's, you probably haven't honed your craft enough. I mean, that's extreme, but I understand. I understand what they're saying because yeah. you it's it takes a while. Fiction's a different kind of writing than expositional. And um so it's it just takes a while to to really find your voice and know what you're doing and doing it right. Um I wouldn't say a million, but I think it does take more than what we give it credit for. So well, I think that's true in nonfiction as well, which is what I do. Finding your angle, finding your voice, and even the way you can be I try I have a very narrative style in what I teach. It is my goal with what I do to accidentally educate people. You know, have people get to the end of my book on hermeneutics, in which I have not used the word hermeneutics or any academic term a single time and then at the end for me to be like ta-da if you made it here you just learned about hermeneutics you know and and so it took me probably even even ghosting for other people seeing what I wanted to be and what I didn't want to be all of that work to form who I am and then in in publishing today uh, for good or for bad it's it's all about platforming and brand yeah and um that I think nowadays you know, 15 years ago, your dues were, I think, editing and writing and being in the trenches with with actually your craft. Now your dues are finding people who are already following you and making you making you making yourself seem as marketable to publishers on the front end, um, because especially in nonfiction, I, I follow publishers weekly, publishers weekly, daily, PW daily. I get it every day. And they always announce like, what are the big, what were the big book deals of the week or even of the day? And fully 70% of those are beauty Queens, people who are on TV, politicians. It's people who are not writers who, but are doing it for a different reason, but they have a platform and because of their name, the publishers know that they're going to sell. And that that's just the business side of it. And I don't like it. I wish publishers were still choosing authors and choosing projects based on talent and ability and what they have to say. Um, That's just not where we are as an industry right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I've um, sent things to publishers, that's you have to fill out a lot of material. And you, the, one of the first things is, all right, what's your platform? Do you have this, 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 this? How, how many followers do you have? And, and okay, <laughs> how many followers? Oh. Instagram, like, what does that have to do with me writing a good book? But you're, you're absolutely right. And, and 
people wanting to get into writing are very, you know, that makes them mad. And I understand that. But yeah, it's just it's, the, it's the reality. It is. It's it's not. And I don't think it's something that comes natural, probably to a lot of people who are hardwired as authors. Um, I've, I've had to enter into that and I do the Facebook thing. I've I've made it my own. Um, I take clips of artifacts and I teach people about it. And if you like if you go on my Facebook, it's very rare that any of my posts are short because I am a writer. I put those up there, but I'm I'm trying to use those platforms to to reach out to people who actually will be readers Mm -hmm. and capture people's attention with, you know, color photographs and all that kind of stuff that you can do now. And so I'm, I'm trying to rewire my brain a little bit to, to, to think about, you know, this is my early engagement with my future readers, um, which, you know, I mean, I think can be helpful, but one thing I realized my last two books, when I didn't have a very large platform, when I entered into agreements with a publisher, what they say you need, you need to be a good writer, you need to have a good hook, and you need to have um, a good following. And they say, if you have two of the three of those, then, you know, that's it. The publisher will help you with a third. My experience has been, I've always had the first two. My following has been the weak link. And I think it's easy for publishers to say that on the front end, but by the time your book is written, it's edited, it's ready to come out. You've got marketing and publicity who they would have to do so much more work when they're starting from scratch with somebody than with somebody who already has a following. And it's just publishers have to make money too. And I think it's the really rare publisher who invests in a person and helps them grow their platform. I also think this could be potentially dangerous for writers because if, if you get in with a publisher early and they're helping you build that platform and craft it in a certain way, then they may be pushing and influencing that writer in a way that person may not naturally go by themselves. So there is value to spending years developing that yourself, figuring out what you want to say and how you want to say it and building it yourself. And it's painful. I hate how much time I spend on Facebook. <laughs> I would much rather be writing all of the time. Sure. But um, I also, I, I mean, I see how that's going to be valuable moving forward. Also, you know, having early responses with people and being able to have interactions about thoughts and ideas that I have, you know, those are going to subconsciously or maybe even consciously work their way in to my next book. So it's um, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be quite as hateful <laughs> as it seems on the front end. As people think it's interesting yeah. that you say that about the, the, the editors and the publishers might be sending somebody in a certain direction. I mean, there's historical examples of that, you know, that have come out, you know, even Harper Lee. I mean, <laughs> she's kind of a, you know, with the Hill Mockingbird and then that later book that came out a few years ago, you know, yeah. it's like, where were the publishers? Who was really, what was really going on here? And I think mm-hmm. that people, you know, ask questions about that. And then I, I recently watched a movie about um, the fellow from Asheville, um, oh, Thomas, um, Thomas Wolfe, you know, and oh. his editor. And, uh-huh. um, and then um, there's been there Raymond Carver. There's been the short story writer. There's been a lot of discussion on that and their the relationship with the editor and the publisher. And of course, there's always going to be that. But, um, I, you know, I really appreciate you saying that, that maybe maybe some people want to get published too early. They're not really ready for it. You know, I think that yeah. can happen, too. Um, so I want you to talk about your books. OK, do a little commercial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. And where, and where we can get them. You told me yeah. the red haired archaeologist slash books dot com. Yeah, uh, red, yeah, redhairedarchaeologist.com slash books. Oh, so, uh, if you just go to redhairedarchaeologist.com, you know, I mean, it's it's all linked from there. Everything that I do, that that is, um, that that's my website. Absolutely, everything is there. Um, I I don't blog as much as I used to because I do spend so much time on social media. Uh, Facebook and Instagram, you can find me, redhaired archaeologist. Um, you can even misspell archaeologist; it'll still pop up. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, or you can search my name. True. <laughs> yes, yes. Because even my name is Amanda Hope Haley, and everyone wants to stick extra letters in Haley. It's just H A L E Y. But um, yeah, everything is there. So my brand. So my brand is the red-haired archaeologist, and 
I am a redhead. Uh, my acquisitions editor from two books ago, I believe she's the one who suggested naming the brand that not just because it's literally true, but also because of the way I think I, I tackle topics. I'm, I'm a little bit of a red haired stepchild when it, when you ask anybody, um, I'm, you know, for, for good or for bad, I am a woman talking about the Bible. There are segments of the population that have problems with that and, um, and trolls who let me know it. <laughs> um, I'm also, you know, I, I am, I'm a, I'm a believer and I came out of Harvard with an even stronger Christian faith than I went into it with, which I think is a little bit different. So I, I think I put my own spin on things. Um, I hope I make everything very accessible. As I said, my goal is to teach people about the Bible, to bring it to life um, without them feeling like they're sitting through a college course or something like that. I, I want to make it fun because the, my true deep love is scripture. And archaeology is, I think, how I see it better. When you're someone like me who has grown up reading the Bible, um, then you're you, from an early age with with things like felt boards and Christian cartoons and all that. We are taught to view the Bible in a certain way, which often is a product of our own culture or even a product of the generations before us. And it's very often not reflective at all of the text. And so I like to spend a lot of time teaching the people the difference between what scripture says and what our traditions say, not to throw the traditions out with the bathwater. Um, I am the biggest Christmas decorator and celebrator you will ever meet, <laughs> even though Mm -hmm. Basically, none of that has very much to do with, with scripture itself, um, but they're beautiful Christian traditions. So I want to honor those, but also help people to understand the difference. And so my book on hermeneutics was called Mary Magdalene Never Wore Blue Eyeshadow. Maybe not the greatest uh, top title in the world because it's not descriptive. But um, in in the intro, I tell the story of when I was at Harvard and I was in a class uh, learning about um we were reading the Gospel of Mary, which is a book from the early Christian period that is not part of our Bible for a lot of really, really good reasons. And in the story, Jesus has given Mary Magdalene some special knowledge, some gnosis, and none of the rest. And she's trying to tell the other disciples about it and they don't want to listen to her. And so the teaching fellow in the class was like, OK, so, you know, why do you all think that the other disciples didn't want to listen to Mary? And I raised my hand, bold as brass, Southern Christian. Well, was it because she was a prostitute? And there was this kid sitting across from me. I can see him to this day, like pink shirt with like the collar popped up. And he rocked back in his chair, actually hit the wall behind him and laughed so hard. And he said, how did you get to Harvard and not know that Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute? And I mean, I know I flushed as red as my hair and the teaching fellow handled it so well. And he explained that is a tradition that comes from the 600s, that comes from Pope Gregory the Great is absolutely not in our text at all. But there I was, masters in religious studies that somehow I had missed this thing. And at that point, I realized it is so much harder to read the Bible and recognize what's not in it than to read it and notice something. And so I think that's what I try to do. And I, I can use archaeology with a lot of it because when you can show somebody an artifact and show somebody what something looks like, it will change the way that we read and we understand scripture. But even beyond that, I especially in that book, Mary Magdalene, I use uh, historical criticism, textual criticism, talk about how the Bible developed, all of that kind of stuff. So that hopefully my readers get as excited about scripture as I am and separate it out from what they've always been told about the Bible. Um, again, like not throwing those traditions away or anything like that, but but understanding the differences between them. And that that's really what I do. Yeah, I, I'm glad you told that story because. It drives me up a wall when people say she was a, a prostitute or, you know, um, yeah, just like, why do you, where did they get this stuff? Is, you know, it's this nowhere. I, I right. think it would have come up somewhere. <laughs> I think the thing the is. Yeah, but when all of those years of reading it and at that point, I mean, I'd been studying it academically for years. 
But I didn't notice because I think every time I read about Mary Magdalene, I saw that in my head. I imagined that that was her backstory to me, even though it's so wrong. And the tradition comes from um, in Luke seven, the sinner, the woman who is washing Jesus feet with her hair. It's not even specified that it's sexual sin. It just says that it's the sinner. Well, so Pope Gregory, because that woman didn't have a name. The next name, the woman in the Bible is Mary Magdalene in chapter eight. And so he just conflated the two. And then he went on to talk about how Mary Magdalene, the seven demons were the seven deadly sins. It's the same homily where we get Mary Magdalene, you know, is is a sinner, is well, he doesn't call her a prostitute, but it develops out of that. We also get a set of seven deadly sins there. And so he's the one who starts all of that. And then over time, if you if you think about Christian history at that point, when he's making that homily, no one questions what the Pope says, right. even if they could. Most people cannot read. And um, if they want to read the Bible, they would have to be Hebrew, Greek or Latin at that point. They're, you know, the vernaculars were not you know, didn't develop it for another thousand years beyond that. Um, and so people learned by essentially hearsay. <laughs> they learned from whatever they were told. And then you get up to the Renaissance and they learned by art. And Mary Magdalene, it, it cracks me up. Yeah. She so often is portrayed in art, not just scantily clad, but also as a redhead because red hair got associated with sin early on. So um, that's that, but that, that's how people learned. And so it got ingrained in us hundreds, even you know, a thousand plus years before here we are now. And I, I do think a lot of us really take for granted that we are able to read the Bible in our own language. Um, that That is something that is really pretty new. Uh, and it's it's wonderful. It's an, it's an amazing tool. And I'm so glad that we all have that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I, I think we sometimes take it for granted and don't understand how really special that is in human history. OK, so that's one of your books. What's another one? <laughs> Uh, so the most recent one is the red-haired archaeologist digs Israel, um, and it's the first in the series. So um, this one I alluded to a little bit in 2019. I went out, I dug at Tel Shimron. And then my husband and my parents had never been to Israel. And so they flew over and met me. And then for two weeks, I toured them around the country and I knew I was going to be writing that book. The original sort of plan was for it to be, you know, kind of picture of artifact explanation, you know, that sort of thing. But touring around the country with them, I got an opportunity to sort of see Israel through new eyes again. And I ended up structuring the book actually around that tour that I took with them, which gave it, I think, a lovely narrative character. And I not only talk about archaeology, but I also I I talk about the modern state of Israel. Um, We actually in the very center of the book, we go to Hebron, which is the largest city in the West Bank. That's where the Tomb of the Patriarchs is. And we got to have lunch with the Palestinian family and see see both sides of the modern conflict while at the same time visiting what is the oldest um, Jewish and Muslim site, which is the the, two, the uh, cave of Machpelah underneath the tomb of the patriarchs. And so there's a lot of really, I think, uh, beautiful opportunity for the old and the new to dovetail with one another, which to me really is what Israel is. Um, it just this constant thousands of years of occupation and importance to various religions and all of that exists together. So um, you, you get some of our funny tribal anecdotes, like when I physically got the car stuck in Nazareth, <laughs> um, physically, it took like the entire neighborhood to get us turned around and out of there. Um, so there are some of those light moments like that, too. But then you you know also get the opportunity to go with us into the West Bank and learn about that. So it is it it's not just it's not just your average archaeology of Israel book. There's a million of those out there. It's it's a little bit different. And anyway, that's what I'm hoping to do then with um, the rest of the series. Um, looks like the next one's going to be about Egypt. So, um, you know, same thing. That's that's the narrative element I like to bring. Oh, wow. So, OK, uh, this podcast is about creativity and we don't really have a definition for that word, but I say it for the podcast, but I say it shows up, creativity shows up rather in surprising ways. Um, how would you position your own creativity in your work? 
Um, actually, I, I think it's sort of what I just said, bringing this narrative element to what I do. I, I have found that I have a passion for taking what is in the academy, you know, what's being taught in the universities. I see that that doesn't usually make it out into the general population. It doesn't make it into our churches, anything like that. Yeah. And so I think for that reason, a lot of people maybe don't think they're capable of understanding what's in the academy. And that's what I hope I do. I hope I use a narrative style and I hope my creativity and my passion comes through to to link those groups of people together so that what's happening in academia can actually change the understandings and, and maybe even the lives of the people who are just reading the Bible every single day. Yeah, that creativity, that that's what makes that bridge. Yeah. That's interesting because for a lot of people I've talked to is creativity is an intersection. It is enrich. You know, yeah. it is um, it's taking uh, one theory that I've heard is it's taking two really disparate things and some and finding that connection, you know, okay. and that something else comes out of it. And that sounds like what you're doing in a sense. Yeah, that's neat. So. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to thank Amanda Hope Haley for spending this time with us. It has been fascinating. I hope you've been excited by her energy. And I hope you've learned a lot, even if you didn't plan on it. <laughs> and uh, as she mentioned, go to redhairedarchaeologist.com slash books to purchase her books. And she will um, sign them. She'll send you yeah. signed copies, which is always better than that other person or that other group we're not going to mention. You don't get signed copies from them. Uh, that behemoth company that <laughs> for books. And so I would direct you there. And she also has a podcast and it's on YouTube. So you can uh, find her on YouTube. So that's that can be very interesting. So thank you again for being with us, Amanda. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Yes, me too. Bye bye. <laughs>